things. And um, one of the things that, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk to as we go through here, but this is more than just a, uh, a, a, an isolated issue with the prodigal, I think, and we're gonna try to make that point. Um, there's a lot of uh, paradigm shifts in this lecture, and I think they're really important. So hopefully we'll get all those covered here tonight. So uh, we're, we're gonna start with what a healthy family dynamic might look like. Uh, if, if you had a, I don't know if there's ever uh, this perfect healthy family I'm describing, but I think I, it wouldn't be a hard reach for you to kind of grasp this, that if that the family was healthy, it would deal with sin uh, daily, right? And he says, take up your cross daily and follow me, right? And John 3.30 says, I, you know, he must become greater, I must become less. So that's, don't you find that, that frustrating sometimes? It's, it's every day, you, you know, it's just... Tomorrow I wake up, I got to do it again because I can. I left to my own accord, no spiritual disciplines in three or four days. It's all about J, K J A Y all the time. So, um, so he deals with sin daily in every family, every member, um, and as strong, capable leadership. There's somebody that's leading. Uh, you know, if you're in business, I know that if you have a leader that you respect that shows up before you do and leaves after you do and, and, and is doing the job and is leading you well, that's a great thing. Unconditional love is foundational. Uh, communication is really clear and it's honest, it's authentic. Um, and everyone feels very safe and protected in that environment. And it's a really well-defined structure. There's boundaries and you know who you are and you know who I am and, and it's true in the parents and the children. That would be a really healthy paradigm. And if it was a Christian paradigm, um, it would deal with sin daily in every family member. And the leaders, the parents would follow God and lead and model, model that. God's word would be the rule book. Uh, it would be unchanging. Um, if, that's, if, if there's, um, I would say something that, I, I, won't, I don't have the time in the lecture to, to make every one of these analogies apply to every single one of you. But I want to take, I think you've You've, uh, it's been on my heart lately that when I say leaders, parents, it would be in an ideal situation, there's single moms here, there's, there's spouses that are spinning out of control, but in an ideal family, the husband would lead well, he would follow God, and, and he, would, he would love his, his wife as Christ loved the church, and she would be happy to be submissive to that. That's what it would look like. But, but there's a lot of things that are prodigal. We started as a prodigal for kids, right? And that's what most of us are. But we've expanded and the words got out and we've got a lot of spouses, we've got par parents or prodigals. So I, all I would do is encourage you is we're, we're, we're trying to sort through that out and meet with some of the uh, spouses and in those groups and try to sort out how, we're, how we can be better at that. But all I can say right now is forgive us if we don't do it exactly, but if you don't see those correlations, that's what closed group's about. How does this apply to me in my situation? He talked about this, but how, how, you know, how, am I, how do I forgive my husband, but yet I can't, what kind of boundaries can I set? It looks a little different in those situations. So let's process that together uh, and try to work through that. Um, I know many, many people that have come through here as spouses and the, and the principals they've left here and they said it's really made a difference. So I, I hope that's true, but just know that we're always trying to figure out how to build a better mousetrap. So open communication, don't be frustrated. Let's talk through it in close group. So anyway, in a healthy family dynamics, God's word is the rule book and it's unchanging. Um, uh, and here's a really important paradigm. In a healthy family, prodigal, your identity is in Christ. And uh, we had somebody in leaders group talk about how his paradigm shift was when he realized that his identity were in other things. And when he began to realize that if he just had his identity in Christ, that was a really huge paradigm shift for him. And I said, perfect timing, because that's what we're going to talk about tonight. It's a really important part about a healthy family. So you're living for him and there's nothing else. And so it's hard to get through that if you're firmly convinced your identity is in Christ. They feel loved, they're forgiven by Christ. Therefore, because of that, they can love and forgive others. And there's open, honest communication and they trust God to not inter and they don't interfere with reaping and sowing and knowing that the most loving thing they can do. So one of the things that, um, that I put this up here, we, we actually have a slide here now, it's much, much easier, but focus on the mobile there. And imagine that mobile is up here. So when I was at Wilderness Treatment Center, the first day, the first lecture we had, um, um, the, uh, uh, we, were, we went into a room and, and a guy had a mobile up there. And, he, and it was just totally stationary, uh, just like that was. And, and so he said, he picked out one of, the, one of the hanging objects and he said, so this is your prodigal and this is your family and it's stable and whatever, but look what happens when your prodigal starts spinning out of control and he hit that one little mobile and it just, everything just started spinning. 
And he said, that's your family, right? That, that's what happens, everybody. It, it can it affect your, the grandparents and the, the parents and, and everybody that's affected. And, 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 I, and I just started thinking about that. It wasn't until I got well into it that I began to think back on that mobile and I began to see it play out in my family. But when that happens and things are spinning out of control, imagine if you're in that mobile, you've got to start, you know, you've got to start trying to change shapes and, and, and balance to get things to get back into position. And so what happens when your prodigal spins out of control, you know, you actually take on new roles. There's, there's a whole different force in the universe and you're trying to fix it and, and you can get into problems when you start uh, trying to get new roles so that you can relieve the pain, stop the spinning, restore the balance, keep everything together, maybe even take the attention away from the one who caused it. So as we take on these new roles, let's look at some of these roles that there are. First of all, there's the addict. And everyone knows who that is. It could be, when I say addict, it could substitute prodigal. Anyone who's not walking with God, it could be addiction to crystal meth and heroin or pornography or same-sex attraction or themselves or people pleasing or whatever it is, rebellion, narcissism, it, it could be any of those things. Um, and some of them are more noticeable than others, but anybody that's not walking with God uh, can be an addict. But if you are an addict, uh, alcoholic, uh, whatever it is, the addict is the center of the family attention. They're the ones that got the mobile spinning. And, um, and that addict is the key to addiction recovery, right? But here's the important paradigm shift. You ready? All caps. The condition of the addict is not the most important element in family recovery and family health. I don't know of any newcomer that's walked into here. I mean, maybe, but I don't think many newcomers that walk into here and don't think that if they could just get their addict under control, their family would be great and life would be good. Um, and so um, we're gonna try to make that point as we go through tonight. But getting that addict back in control is not the, it's, it's helpful, we're for it, totally for it, but it's not the most important thing in getting your family recovered and healthy. So uh, another role is the hero, okay? So um, the hero uh, could be a sibling, could be somebody in the family, tries to be perfect in order not to cause any more problems with the family. It's often a perfectionist, often present things in an unrealistically positive light, but underlying there's, there's fear and there's guilt and there's shame. Uh, this was my daughter. She's been up here on stage a couple of times, but with new babies and, and a new job, and it's just hard to get her back up here. But I'll tell you what she said, is that, um, oh, I'll tell you what happened, is that we were, uh, you know, you're going through, right? And, 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 and the fire is over here in the corner, right? And there's some other things going on, and Jenny kept saying to me, something's wrong with Molly. And I said, not Molly, I mean, Molly is my, she's my, self-starter, she makes better grades than I ever did. She's the leader of cross country, she's captain of this and mother to all the girls and there's nothing wrong with Molly, that's the last thing I need. Uh, Jenny, you've gone off the deep end again. And so she began to tell me that over the years and I just, you know, like, any, like most of us, right, that, that are enablers or we're struggling, we just don't need one more problem when we come home, I just never really, it never sunk in. So one day um, in high school, uh, Jenny said it again, and I, for some reason, Molly, I said, Molly, tell me what's going on. You know, what, what, what's mom talking about? And she said, Dad, I don't understand it. She said, I, she said, you know, my circumstances are no different, but I just feel sometimes there's this darkness and there's like a cloud that comes over me and I can't explain it, but I, there's no circumstances that are different, but I feel, it just feels dark and I feel sad and I, when I just went, okay, all right, we're going to the, the psychologist. And so um, we sent her to two sessions to the psychologist, right? And uh, it's before prodigal, long before prodigal. And we went there, and you know what her problem was? She'd never mentioned it to me one time. It was Hunter, right? It was Hunter. Never mentioned it. And her issue was, see, Hunter was uh, uh, biracial and not, didn't look like her. You know, and they were in the same grade. So, but she knew what, what he was pulling. She knew all of that. So her dilemma was if she told us, she saw the pain. If she didn't feel, tell us, she felt the guilt. And she just struggled with that the whole time, right? It was just, 
And, and I never saw it. I mean, never had a clue. I just was shocked, right? And uh, I think it's the same kind of thing that my son struggles with now with regard to he's never had a problem with his biraciality and being the only black kid in a white school or being adopted. It's never probably had no problems. We got nothing. It's good. It's all good. Uh, thumbs up. <laughs> so I don't know what it is, but that's, that's my guess. But the point is, is that I tell that story for everybody out there that might be me, and there might be somebody else that you ought to sit down and go, are you okay? I mean, it's okay if you're not, and, uh, but, but the hero was us. Other people that might give you a red flag is if you have a mascot in your family, a joker, use, you know, using uh, a lightheartedness to reduce, the, reduce the, the tension in the house. And you, you hinder the, but, but what happens is that you, you, uh, you hinder everything because it's not true. You're deflecting the focus and you can't deal with the real, the, the issue and it, it, it hinders the addiction recovery. And the underlying feelings again are shame, anger, want us to go away, let's not talk about it. There's a lost child that, that withdraws and becomes quiet. It just comes in the room, goes upstairs, locks the door, uh, and uh, it avoids the issue, the issue altogether. And they just begin to give up anything they need because they'd rather just check out. And, uh, uh, and their underlying feeling again is guilt, loneliness, neglect, begins to eat at them, have anger. Uh, then there's the scapegoat. They would rather uh, act out in family situations. They deflect the attention away from the prodigal by uh, rebelling and diversion. Uh, the underlying feelings, again, are shame and guilt and emptiness. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is where we go from teaching to meddling. Uh, we have the enabler. And uh, this t-shirt says enabler on the front, and on the back it said it was partially my fault. And uh, uh, so uh, the enabler makes all the other roles possible. Um, again, if you, if uh, I've told you the story, but uh, John Poitivant, who's, who's helped us out, was very, very uh, uh, um, active in recovery. And uh, I saw him talking with the family. I've shared this with you before, but it really struck me. And I, I, I think I've seen it hold true for, and I've used it myself. But he said, you know, uh, you know my, husband's an alcoholic or my uh, son's an addict and he, he just always says oh that's, I'm so sorry to hear that and so who's the enabler and and it, it it just gets their attention right because it's hard to keep that up for a long time unless someone is aiding and abetting to some degree and it's not a it's not that you're not you don't love them that's the whole point I mean that, that's what's hard about this ministry it's hard about living with an addict or an alcoholic or wherever you love them to death you want them to be good your your motives are pure it's just it gets confused what love looks like. And so um, it usually requires something to keep it going, to look the other way, to uh, uh, just uh, give them a little way out because you love them. And uh, so I would tell you that the enabler is the key to family recovery. So if the enabler is the key to family recovery, the enabler who, is who comes to prodigal, right? It's not the prodigal, so the enablers are here. So if that's true, if the enabler is the key to family recovery and you came here to restore peace and lead your family well, guess who doesn't have to be here? The prodigal. Huge paradigm shift. You can restore your family health. You can restore your integrity, your leadership. Restore the family dynamics to something that people would emulate independent of your prodigal and what they're doing. That's a really radical concept. So you might want to explore that a little bit in closed group, but I hope I can expand on that here in a second. So um, the enabler tries to keep everyone happy, family balance. Again, that's what I was doing. When I came home, there were issues. I was trying to deal with one issue. So when Jenny told me there were other issues, I, I want to try to keep that over there. Molly didn't have a problem. Hunter's not as bad as, as you're saying he is. Work's a mess. I'm just trying to keep everything going, right? That's just what, that's what we do. So it takes one to know one. So uh, it, you, you make excuses for those behaviors. Boys will be boys. You minimize the issues, and it just delays the need for help. And uh, so, as I said, the naval aren't bad people. They're caring, compassionate. They're just confused on what love looks like. And uh, I would tell you that 
the reason, and you've heard me say it before, um, you can overcome your enabling, but overcoming and enabling means that you have to back off. And that means you have to trust that everything's going to turn out okay, or you have to trust that God is in control more, more, more reasonably. Uh, you can trust that everything's going to turn out, but I think that takes greater faith without knowing God than the, than the latter. Trusting that God is good, He's enough, He loves you. So that's why I don't, anybody that comes in here as a newcomer that is not a believer, doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, and doesn't, you know, I mean, we love you. I've, I've, I was that way for 30 years. I mean, no, no judgment here. It's just that when we get in about eight weeks, when we start talking about laying your Isaac down, you're giving them to a God, and it's nice to know that you can trust your, trust your son to that God. And so that's why we really encourage you to really explore your faith and, and that perception of who God is. Remember that Tozer thing, the most important thing about any man at any point in time is what he believes about God in that moment. Not what he thinks, not what he says about God, but what he truly believes in his heart. If you really believe God is who he says he is and you can believe in his promises, then you're, 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 you're willing to lay your Isaac down. So um, if you're an enabler, I don't think you have a right view of God. I don't. I think that if you really believe who God is, then, and you know who he is, um, and we've all been there, so I'm not saying that I do and you don't. I'm just saying I, that was true of me. I, I think it's true of most of us. Uh, and the more we're, we're fully dependent on God because we know who he is, the less we will enable, I promise you. Uh, it's not clear and confident on a godly purpose and mission statement because we don't have that right view of God. Um, and, um, and it could even be codependent, which could be because of some selfishness and some neediness. And, and uh, that not all be about you, but it could, some of those things could apply to enablers. You can pick and choose whatever that might apply to you just in order to do some self-realization and take some, take some ground because that's what this ministry is all about. So the enabler kind of presents a false front or, and rationalizes um, kind of closed to the public, but Proverbs 28, 13 um, um, is one that has really, um, it's really important in our house. Um, and it's, he who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Um, over the last 12 or 13 years, I have a paradigm shift. I, I don't believe the addiction, I don't believe slipping up in addiction is as heinous as lying. I think, I just read a book called Fearless about a seal named Adam Brown. It's really, I mean, that book's been sitting on my shelf for two years. And Jenny gave it to me to read and I read it in Hawaii. And it was perfect timing because it contrasted the situation that he went through with what um, we're experiencing now just a little bit. And, and the point was is that this was a kid that never lied about his addiction. He told his wife, you know, if I don't show up at home, took her in the car and said, if I don't show her home, I'm, I'm going to be in one of these four houses. Crack cocaine was his deal. I'm going to be in one of these four houses. Come get me. I don't want to be there. But sometimes, he kept saying, his, his word was, sometimes it's just calling my name. And when I hear it calling my name, he would tell his wife about it. And then sometimes when he didn't tell her, he just wouldn't show up. And she went and grabbed him. But he never lied about it. And when he picked her up, he was remorseful. He was repentant. I don't know why I do it. And slowly but surely, he never lied about it. And he went on to be in Navy's. It is an amazing book. It's called Fearless by Eric Blem. It's about a true story about Adam Brown. And, the, and, the, and, the, and he finally got out of it. He became a hero, American hero, and he eventually beat his addiction. But it's almost impossible to gain ground if you're never truthful about it. I could tolerate it if you said, hey, I fell, and if I get wrong, come get me here. I don't want to do it. And, he t and I never catch him lying. Well, that's just sin. That's what I do on a re all too regular basis, right? But I hope that I renounce it. I, I don't conceal it, I confess it, and I find mercy so I can go on and I can have a relationship with God. Sin separates me from God. And I know it separates our prodigals from God. So I just preach that and preach that to our prodigals and to, to my prodigals and your prodigals and, and myself. And uh, uh, 
Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. An enabler needs someone to help them see what they're doing because it feels like love and it needs to be pointed. That happened to me this week by my community group in a, in a, in a, in a real narrow era, era, area in which I'm not sure I've been counseling in the right way for the last 10 years. Just a small area, but I, I think they sharpened me this week. And uh, it was fixed, they're fixed on controlling the issues and the other role players and the underlying feelings uh, are really, for the enabler, is inadequacy, fear, helplessness, loss of control. If I can't keep this together, I don't know what it's going to look like. Um, the enabler's motives um, seem noble and pure on the surface because uh, it's love, it's protection, uh, but they can be selfish. It's self-worth, it's, it's, it's what do you look like to the community, reputation, and, uh, and I think you can only make progress in enabling when your motives are examined through a biblical purpose or a mission statement. So you have a view of God, you write your mission statement, and you follow that every day. Um, enabling minimizes and reduces the pain temporarily. It increases the pain. Uh, enabling minimizes and reduces the pain. Eliminating enabling increases pain for the prodigal. And we don't want to hurt our kids, but we've done everything else, and sometimes pain, or pain to our spouses, pain to our kids, uh, letting them suffer the consequences of their actions are the most loving thing we can do, as you hear over and over again. Prodigals are human. No humans like pain, and, and pain's the fastest way to alter behavior. We talked about that last week, those feedback loops. And uh, prodigals need to alter their behavior, so the goal is eliminating enabling. I will say this, though. Um, I said it in the slide before here, I think, where it said my underlying feelings as an as a, uh, enabler was inadequacy, fear, helplessness, and loss of control. And um, when I meet people in this situation, are, are like my good buddy who called me the other day and uh, visited him two weeks ago in Little Rock because he's a fantastic surgeon. I was watching him do surgery and he calls me last week and he's having seven vessel bypass, right? And, uh, I take advantage of those opportunities and say, I love you, I'm going to pray for you. But man, I tell you, I know you're going to sound this crazy, but I think it's so awesome. And what a blessing a man has when he realizes he's inadequate. That, that he, he, most people in this room, we juggle balls, we control our jobs, we, we're good at it, we know how to do all that stuff. And when, it, and when I got to the point, and I couldn't, with my brother's death and my son's addiction, I, I was out of control. And at that point, you have to stop and you have to figure out what is truth. If you don't, you can fool yourself and just keep going, right? You just keep going and you keep juggling that ball and you hope that it, it's not sudden death. You, you praise God because it's just chest pain and you get to have seven jumps and start over again, right? Seven bypasses and you, get, and you get to go again. So this helped me realize I was not in control and I really had to double down on what truth is. That's a good thing. Um, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but if you're here, don't lose, don't lose that opportunity. So, if you look for family roles in addiction and codependency, the information and help must be sought for the whole family. Don't miss that. This is a whole family issue. Don't assume that, you're, that even their, the, the most bulletproof of your family members is worth a discussion to make sure. And uh, it turns out that, that it's prodigal idol worship is, is what the issue is, is that the prodigal is worshiping their addiction. They love you. It seems so, your, your husband loves you. Um, you know he does, but, but you're standing between them and their addiction and they do crazy things to hurt us because all they really want is that. They, they love you, they just don't love it quite as much as the addiction. And uh, because they're filling something in their hole that should be filled uh, with the proper view of God. And the enabler worships pride and reputation need to have value, but as parents, or as spouses, it's hard to know that we could worship to the point that we love our prodigal, or our husbands, or our wives more than God. And anything we put above God is an idol, and it's unhealthy. So, um, and there are other role players that have idol worship. So, an unhealthy prodigal family looks like this. The prodigal chaos is felt to be the most important focus on the family. Um, and newcomers don't feel guilty about that. We all felt that way. And just that's probably what you feel like tonight is that if I just got to get this chaos squared away, 
Um, most of the calls we get over the over to the church, and most of the people newcomers, or a lot of people newcomers, either come to the end of their rope, or their kids coming home from Arkansas next week, and they got to make a decision, or they're getting out of prison next week, and they got to make a decision. And it's and it's that's the most important thing. And if they can get that solved, then they're they're on the right road. But the prodigal issue is not the cause of family problems. It only exposes the pathology or, or a dysfunction. I, you hear that? The prodigal issue only exposes what the real family problem is. And uh, that family problem is usually caused by denial, poor leadership, lack of following God, not realizing they've drawn a circle around themselves, they've got boundaries, they've got consequences, they've got rules, they enforce them. If a prodigal spins out of control and you have all that in place, then you're okay. But if the prodigal spins out of faith, if someone in your cancer family gets sick and it spins out of control, that's not the problem. It just, it's just, it just uncovered the problem that existed in that family. Um, a lack of following God, a lack of total trust in God. And uh, we're all guilty of that. So when that happens, you, you blame, you cover up, um, you make open, honest discussion is minimal to absence. So when a healthy family, family comes in, you have a proper view of God. And that proper view of God directs a mission statement while you get up every day to glorify God in all that you do. Uh, you all have your mission statements. Everybody that's, that's out of open group should have a personal mission statement. And uh, um, I hope our leaders ask you that from time to time. Um, and so, uh, so that the healthy family d dynamics are formed. And so your identities are found in Christ. Uh, that's what Hugh was saying in leaders group back there. He said, you know, when I found that my identity was in Christ and that's it, I didn't have to worry about what the neighbors thought or what my prodigal thought or what anybody thought. When I began to realize that God loved me and Christ loved me and I was chosen by him and, and my identity, I, my worth was because he died for me. And when that happens, you don't have to change, you don't have to be a hero or a scapegoat or an enabler or anything. You just are who you are and you, you follow him and that changes everything. Then your communication is direct and open. You deal with your conflict, keep short accounts, you deal with it directly. Um, the boundaries are really well defined. You enforce the consequences and enabling is eliminated. Uh, it's Proverbs 29, 15, discipline your son and he'll give you peace. He'll bring delight to your soul. We all kind of come here because we want peace, right? Everybody comes to that newcomer group says, I'd love to have peace and order restored to my, my family. God said, okay, discipline your son and he will give you peace. He will bring delight to your soul. It's a little bit different when it's your spouse and you discipline them um, because you have a covenant relationship. But there are ways to set boundaries. There are ways to protect yourself uh, in which they can suffer pain and still maintain that covenant. And uh, we can talk about that. Uh, so healthy families provide a healthy recovery environment. Uh, again, the substance addiction is not the key to family recovery. The keys to family recovery um, are individual recovery. The keys to family recovery is when everybody there realizes their identity is in Christ and that's all they need. A family gets healthy when they have good, strong parental leadership. They see that they're, they're, they're guided by God and their community. Um, you know, I, one of my best friends in the world is a surgeon that I went to medical school with. He's been one of my best friends forever, and he was citizen of the year at San Angelo last night. So I flew out at five o'clock and came back on the 5 a.m. this morning to introduce him. And who followed me was his son, his 19-year-old son. It was crazy, right? I mean, he just stood up there. I mean, this guy, he said, you know, that he, he just said, you talk about a, a father that's modeled for his son. And he just, I mean, we've all seen it. We, they were making fun of him and saying, you know, John, would you just, it would be help us all if you just do something like, just jaywalk one day or something, right? I mean, just, the guy is crazy, just humble. I mean, he's just one of the, he's one of the most unique men. He's, he, I really, I think he would say that, I've, that we have walked a spiritual walk and, and maybe I've mentored him a little bit in that, but in terms of just being a good man, and he's a strong Christian man, to see his, to see his 19-year-old freshman at TCU talk about his father and the way he led and that God was his priority, um, you can't talk like that. Unless you, he wouldn't get up there and say that if all, the, if all he had done was talk about it and not model it the other six days. It, it was just such a great thing to see. So the parental leadership, Leads, it leads by not just talking, not just taking church on Sunday, but doing the things of sacrifice and to uh, 
um, and, and, and building in and modeling that. And then you need community, that they, that, that they, they sharpen themselves in community. Uh, community's a great way out, right? If, you, if you're struggling with your, and your kid wants to put you in a corner, and, or your husband wants to put you in a corner, or your wife, you can say, you know what, I'm not sure, it's a complex issue. How, how comforting is to say, it's, I'm not sure, it's a complex issue, and you, and you deserve the right answer. I need to pray about this, I need to process it in scripture, and I want to run it past wise counsel in my community so that I can give you the right answer. I'm too emotional, I love you too much, I don't trust myself. Community is that, is that bailout. It's, not, it's, it's just such a huge tool. It's not a burden. And then God's on the throne in a, in a healthy family. So I'm going to throw out the question that, um, that is the ultimate paradigm shift, and it's exactly what, what the gentleman last week was talking about. He got it in an hour. What if this journey's about you? It may not be. But I doubt it, okay? It, it, it is about your prodigal, no question. But I don't know if this applies to you. You may be the perfect Christian and the perfect, you may be leading your family well, and if you are, I mean, there are people out there like that, and me. But what if God just said, hey, um, man, Jay, you're a wor what he said to me was, looking back on it was, you know, you're not a bad guy. You've led worship for seven years at your church. Um, you've been at BSF for 11 years. I think you love me, but you think a lot about yourself a lot. You know, you stumble at times. I've got so much more. You have no idea what I have for you. You, you have no clue what I have for you, right? I have this, right? He said, so what I got to do, though, I got to give you a little thorn in the flesh because left of your own accord, man, you're in Hawaii. You know, you, you, you go there a lot, you know, and you go play golf a lot, and I just need to get your attention. So I love you enough, but trust me, that pain's going to bring you to me, and we're going to walk in a way that you cannot believe. I'm going to tell you, the last 10, 11, 12 years of my life have been crazy good, right? I mean, they've been the worst years of my life and the very, very best that I've been with God, and I wouldn't change that for anything. But I wouldn't have been there if I had not had a prodigal, I guarantee you. And so, have you ever asked Jesus to enter your heart? Are you, just, are you just going through the motions? I don't know. Is it your faith or is it your parents' faith? Uh, is it something that it's cultural in the South that you're doing? Do you believe it just because it's the right thing to do and your neighbors are doing it? Are you a believer that's not really fully devoted, not fully trusting? I don't know. I mean, it's probably not. But if it is, awesome. You're here. You got to hear it. You get to change right now. You know what he says? He said the same thing. I mean, it's never too late, right? Because on the cross, there were two choices. One of them, one of the, one of the, one of the thieves just didn't, didn't, he just wanted Jesus to get them all off because he wanted to get him out of the situation. And the other one said, man, this is the Son of God. I'd love to join you in paradise. You can't get any last minute, man. He's got minutes left. And Jesus said, perfect, man. There is no time limit. You're in. So change. Let's go. Let's get fully devoted. And let's use this. What if this was about you? That's our, that's our prodigal ministry goal. Jonathan McClude, one of our, our pastors here, says, life's a journey to discover what's important. And I think that if you could figure out what's important and that it might be about you and a fully devoted follower of Christ is uh, the world says, I like, I like so-and-so. They're a Christian who's not so over the top. Let me just tell you, if you, if you understand what Christ did and he died for us, and he, you know what Christ wants of us? He has one thing, everything. He gave everything to us. He, he, he's not just... He's, not, he's about love. He's a fork in the road. He asked the rich young ruler to go and sell it all. Right? And when he walked away, he was sad. But that was what was getting between him and God. He wants it all. And the rich young ruler, right? Do we know this? What if he had given that all up? I guarantee you in five years he'd have gone, holy cow, what an amazing life. What an amazing life. So 
We want you to leave here with a personal testimony that you believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart. We want this pain to drive you to that. We want you to have a view of God that has a mission statement that says, I'm, you're going to bring Him glory every single day. When you step foot out of bed every morning, you know why you're getting out of bed, and it's for Him. If it's for Him, then the circumstances don't matter because you get to magnify Him even greater when the world comes and attacks you every single day. But if it's about you, that day's not a good one. But if it's about Him, it's a huge opportunity to stand above the crowd and then develop a plan. Develop a plan going forward for your prodigal, for yourself, to lead your family. And so, and my point is, is that if you leave here and you know that He is good, you can trust Him fully, He loves you, He cares, and if everything's stripped away, He's enough, then when you leave this ministry, there's not anything that can, get, that can harm you because you have that truth. And so when the cancer comes, when your last days come, when your prodigal spins out of control again, when the troubles that we're promised happen, you're prepared and you bring Him glory and the world says, I want what you have. And when you get there, unbelievable rejoicing in heaven when you meet Him face to face and He says, well done. So 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer for everyone who asks, Why do you, do you act the way you do? How, how, can, you, how can you be so um, hopeful in your situation? So the only reason is uh, the memory verse for the week. We don't lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Dear Lord, I just thank you for those words and how encouraging they are. Um, it doesn't, you know, it just almost seems offensive to us at times when you say these troubles are light and momentary. Forgive us uh, because we put ourselves on the throne and think that this is the most, at least 70 to 80 to 90 years compare with millions and billions and trillions, and still there's an eternity past that. To spend with you, to do whatever it is in heaven that is going to be beyond our wildest dreams. Help us to serve you. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us your all. Uh, help us to not be offended because um, you want to give us freedom and you want our all. Lord, uh, help us to change these paradigms. Help us to do the first thing, and that's lead ourselves well tonight. Uh, in Christ's name we pray, amen.